I've been living and eating and breathing Peru Bay since I was um, probably 15, 16 years old when I saw the first couple of posters of uh, De Clos La Salle and you know, all these guys riding the cobbles. Even as a junior, I was down to Belgium a couple of times and got to ride the proper cobblestones. Uh, I just found this sort of weird, strange love for, for riding cobblestones and realized I was quite quick at it as well. I hadn't been able to race it for two years because of riding for a slightly smaller team. And then finally getting into a team which was big enough again to get an invite to Perro Bay. I just made it my mission that year that I was going to be on that start line as fit as I could possibly get. I also had two of the most incredible teammates in Andrea Tafi and uh, Fabio Baldato who, you know, in their own rights would have been clearly capable of challenging for, for the win in, in that year's um, race. So to have those guys riding alongside me and certainly Taffy for the first 150 kilometers until he, he crashed in the forest of Arenberg. Well there's lots of crashes happening at the back end of the main field which is why you've got to get into the forest of Arenberg in an ideal position. You know that was invaluable just having him there as a guardian angel really. As we got through the forest came out the other side it was a relatively small group left you know there's only maybe 25 riders left in that in, in the front group. It's every man for himself here just now as the leaders race towards the end of the forest of Arnberg. And I had Baldato with me and uh, you know he came back and he said look you know how are you feeling? I said I don't think the mechanic had put a chain on the bike. Um, just had one of those days you know where, where nothing didn't matter how hard I tried, you just felt that there was more and more there all the time. I said, look, all right, look after Monsieur from Peter Gem and uh, Besemann. Those are your three riders, I'll cover the rest. And I mean, if, if you've ever watched Baldato ride a bike, he's, he's a class act. Nothing moves apart from his legs. He's, you know, it's almost beautiful to watch. Baldato is sat in there just just behind him. This is a big move by Fabio Baldato. But that day, in the end, when he told me on to uh, the Carrefour Darb. I don't think he had anything left because he was he was all over the bike, just giving everything he had to get me into the right position. Came in there, third wheel, and uh, Museo opened up the taps full gas across the, uh, the Carrefour, and I thought, this is, this is stinging a bit now. Museo looks over his shoulder, he wants to know how many riders are left in this group with him. He wants to eliminate as many people as possible. Well, obviously, as we got out on the other side, turn around, I realised there was only five of us left. This is big Magnus Baxter here, and a rider whose wedding he attended not long ago, Roger Hammond in white, a rival. I bet they never thought they would be in the leading group in Paris-Roubaix this year. And then we just kept on taking turns, you know, me, uh, Museo, Roger Hammond, Cancellar and Tristan Hoffman. And... I remember going across the final section, which um, is going through a hem, and uh, you got tarmac on each side of the um, of the cobblestones. And literally, you know, you have to cut across the cobbles a few times to sort of get the straightest line and all that. I remember just getting across from one side to the other, just managed to flick around a, a reasonably sized stone. I thought that oh, I was lucky, and straight away I thought if if no one else has clips that clips that one, it, you know, it's it's a miracle. Um, at the very same split second as I hear that, you know, noise of a puncture going and uh, turn around and that is Museo gone. Oh, he's got a problem. A problem for Museo, a back wheel, a flat, wheel tire. flat tire. Um, flat tire for very unfortunate for him, very fortunate for the rest, for the other four of us. Uh, so we really didn't think twice about keep on going and, you know, getting to the velodrome because part of Perro Bay is staying clear of punctures and keeping yourself in the best, you know, out of trouble all the time. The crowd will welcome them. They've watched them for hours on television. And obviously coming into the velodrome between, you know, the four of us, I'd studied every single bit of footage there that there was available. He's moving up to the bank and down again. It's going to be cat to see how people were moving on the on the track when the sprint was open up, whether you know if you were boxed in, whether there was a way to get around it. Um, so as I decided to open up my sprint on the back straight, Roger Hammond obviously had exactly the same idea because if you freeze frame that and go frame by frame, there's one frame in between the moment where I start diving down and the, the frame that Roger starts diving down. So you know I got myself boxed in on the inside, but I didn't actually realise how much the research that I'd done about the sprints 
what was kind of helped me at that point because I just stayed cool, I just stayed where I was. I wasn't trying to back around every, all the, the other three riders, you know. Cancelo was in front of me, Roger Hammond on the outside. And I thought as soon as Roger goes, you know, over the top of Cancellara, he's gonna swing up in the track or start drifting up in the track to make Roger go a bit further. That's exactly what happened and, you know, two pedal strokes on the inside on the Cote d'Azur and that was it. And yeah, still by far the most incredible feeling that I've ever felt. Just putting your hands up like that and realizing your childhood dream. It's just phenomenal.